This session is entitled Let's Operate with Respect Campaign. We're going to hear from Dr Chris Pike. Chris is an Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Queensland, based at the Mata Public and Private Hospitals here in Brisbane. He's a former President of the Breast Surgeons Society of Australia and New Zealand. He's currently a Counsellor with the Royal Australian College of Surgeons and a Chair of the Post-Fellowship Education and Training Committee. Uh, but outside of work, he enjoys bushwalking and art history. And Chris's wife is a guide at the Museum of Modern Art that we were at last night. She is a Goma guide. Uh, Chris described himself as a crash test dummy for all of the Goma art tours. Uh, hopefully, Chris will be able to explain to us the meaning of the creepy giant woman in the bed sculpture. Uh, and so much more, he joins us to talk about the Operate With Respect campaign. Can you please, with respect, give a round of applause to Chris Pike. Chris, thank you very much for joining us. Great introduction, Andrew. That's fantastic. <laughs> and the college, I'd like to thank the organisers for allowing us to present on this subject. Um, I, I can't tell you about the creepy woman in the bed, except can't you feel the emotion? And that's the artist's skill there. Um, the, the, the theme of this talk is really that uh, uh, we have a problem and we're trying to address, address it. Um, and it's, um, it, we think it touches other workplaces as well, but really it's... Um, it has come home to roost at our workplace. So it's all about building respect um, and about bullying and discrimination and sexual harassment. And, and really, we're not brought up to be that person and we are not like that. It's exactly what we thought until someone called us out on it. So um, a, a surgeon published a book uh, and said it was easier to give in to uh, sexual advances of your bosses in the workplace when you're a trainee rather than make a fuss. That's the only way to get through training. And Four Corners um, exposed the problem as well. So it led to the formation of an expert advisory group that really wanted to um, make a safe workplace for both patients and healthcare workers. So when you ask yourself the question about bullying, you just have to ask yourself, how far does the person behind the reception desk have to put a barrier in your way before you escalate the problem? I think we all, all have the potential there to be somewhat less than completely uh, honourable in our dealings. And, and in, in all workplaces where there are problems with uh, discrimi discrimination, sexual harassment and bullying, there, there are enablers and there are barriers as well. And I think one of our big things is, is the uh, hierarchical nature of um, surgical training, that is uh, the apprenticeship model where the trainee, and, uh, the trainee is uh, both taught by and is assessed by the same person. Um, so a survey was done that uh, found that uh, really there was a lot of it out there. The, the, the theme of this part of the talk is really the bad, the worse and the uglier really. So 49% um, of fellows had experienced it. Most trainees had been bullied at some part of their training. Uh, sexual harassment was rife. Um, e even the people who never ever said anything out loud, when you quizzed them about it, they said yes, they, most of them had not gone through their training without some form of unwelcome sexual advance from their bosses and most hospitals had seen it. So there were all those things that we think we shouldn't be doing. Um, th there was discrimination because people uh, became pregnant, had to take time off work, or had uh, sick children, and uh, because of race. There was bullying, there was the kind of things that uh, surgeons are awkwardly, um, you would think, are, are notorious for, throwing instruments and throwing offal and uh, uh, dismissiveness and, uh, and criticism. And uh, even worse than that uh, were the un unwelcome sexual advances and uh, uh, somewhat uh, taken aback that um, most of us in a fairly uh, energy enriched environment of the operating theatre would be prone to sexual innuendo which uh, as it turns out most people don't find very attractive. So. Anyway, so there we have trainees who are telling us on direct questioning that they were paralysed with fear, that uh, it affected their lifetime happiness, made them felt like crying, uh, their training time was awful, they were depressed, they had suicidal thoughts, they had massive loss of confidence. And these are the ones that stayed in training. We've done exit interviews of people who've left training and their, their conclusions are worse than those. So 63% of current trainees, that is, that is uh, the denial is there, you know, surely it doesn't happen anymore. But these, these are current trainees and uh, then it's just a few bad apples, well that's the, the great denial and we've all got that in spades. So uh, an expert advisory group was formed, uh, there was a public apology, the president of the college at the time, David Waters, gave a public apology. 
Rob Knowles, former Health Minister for Victoria, was part of the expert advisory group. And then a 42-point plan was enacted that came into three broad headings, um, all to do with building respect and improving patient safety, which is the name of the session anyway. And uh, education and working parties were formed on things that we thought were flashpoints, uh, less than full-time working, trainee supervision, board diversity, and international medical graduate supervision. So the three broad strokes of the pen are cultural change. I have to say, for any of you that run companies, this is the... I don't run a company, but uh, this is the hardest thing to do, cultural change. Um, the rest of the talk is how, how we've struggled with that. Education, we think, is a strong point because we're an educational body, and complaint handling is enabling whistle, whistleblowers. So there, there were lots of goals. I'll gloss over this, uh, all to do with um, uh, the, the culture of the organisation. Uh, the next lot were surgical education, and the last part, complaint management. So a year later, what, what, what have we got to show for that? So cultural change. Um, so the f first area that we had to deal with was uh, the workplace. We, we, uh, although we're uh, 6,000 fellows, um, only 20% of full-time employees of hospital, the rest are kind of sole traders contracting to hospitals, either public or private. So governance of that group is pretty hard to do, but you have to meet with the employing bodies. You have to meet with the people on the workplace. There, there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meetings and, uh, and uh, with the broad aim of getting agreement that uh, there is bullying and that it needs to change and that we, uh, we need to be taking it all seriously. So MOUs are signed with many private health um, uh, uh, systems around the country um, um, and uh, many of the public health systems as well. Uh, and um, you know there are the glory shots for uh, for the yearbooks for everyone everyone who was there. Um, so we had a campaign, a kind of media blitz, as it were, to uh, our six thousand fellows. Um, and in the workplace, uh, we made uh, we made uh, videos and we made posters, things that can hang up in your workplace. Um, hopefully, with a local champion who would have some kind of reassuring message on there about uh, bullying and how it can affect uh, the workplace badly. And uh, that, that has been a big blitz, I must say, but I think outside of the surgical workspace, most people would not be aware of it. And a suitable poster, my colleague Adrian Anthony from Adelaide, um, you know, a direct link between the bully and bad outcomes. The people who don't perform well in the workplace with behaviour don't perform well with their surgery as well. There is a direct link. We need to get the message out there. Um, and regardless of the authorship, we're indebted to the Australian military for this catch cry, which we found very useful in our workplace as well. Um, um, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. Education, as I said, we, we, we're an educational body. We get accredited by universities. And uh, the implementation of courses is, uh, is within the DNA of our college. So we, uh, we've got an e-learning module that's compulsory. So compulsory that only 34% so far have completed it. Um, it's a one hour thing. and. Uh, Look, at, uh, it shows bullying in the workplace and there's a, a test that you have to get 90% for to progress to the end of the test. And if you don't pass after a number of times, you get some counselling, which is kind of good. Um, so you can see this is an area we need to improve as well. There's uh, honing your skills as a surgical educator, including how to give feedback without bullying someone, how to tell someone that they're their performance wasn't perfect and how can we all move forward from there. So we, we, we've run a lot of courses in that, 36 uh, last year, and I think there are another 70 going this year, but th there are 6,000 surgeons to get through those courses 20 at a time. Uh, and areas that we need to strengthen are the international medical graduates. They're a, they're a lost tribe in our college. Um, the Rackstar means the trainees. We've given them an executive officer and uh, an anonymous feedback tool. Multi-source feedback has been pointed out by various jurisdictions, uh, including health departments. We should be using that more so that those around us who are not surgeons can tell us how we appear to them in the workplace and courses, as I said. So complaint handling. This is really to enable whistleblowers. Um, it's um, kind of interesting. Uh, we've uh, implemented a database, uh, we've employed a complaints officer who's a psychologist um, with some experience in the Ombudsman's office um, and uh, we've uh, got a new code of conduct that we're trying to enforce and uh, then we had to develop a hierarchy of what level of complaint would progress to the next level and how can people make anonymous complaints. Um, so we have a centralised management. There's one hotline for each country. It's a binational college, proudly ANZAC, if I could say. 
uh, so centralised complaints, uh, the patient making the at least not the patient, the person making the complaint has the option of whether they want it to remain anonymous or whether they think it needs to um, progress. They, they are triaged in a discrete way with uh, very limited membership in a secure database, uh, kind of in a bunker in Melbourne for what it's worth. Um, and uh, the, uh, it, it's can, we follow the Vanderbilt principles of early local intervention for alternative dispute resolution as the ideal way to resolve the disputes. And we try not to duplicate anything that might be happening in the person's workplace at the same time. So the Vanderbilt principles, um, uh, the Cognitive Institute here, I noticed they, they would be fully over this. Uh, it's really a stitch in time saves nine kind of thing. The um, unprofessional behaviour, um, uh, if a suitable senior or a suitable trained person can just go and have a cup of coffee and say to them, look, I'm, there was an incident yesterday, kind of like a, you know, a, a, a breach in the force, um, something, there, there was a warp there, something happened, what, what do you think happened? Like it's um, just that kind of level. And even just calling the person out on that seems to affect the behaviour of most people for most instances. Uh, the escalation of intervention is based on further events occurring. So. With the complaints, uh, really, the collecting them, it's, especially if they're anonymous, if there's, the, if there's a cluster of anonymous complaints about the one person, clearly it has to escalate. But really, the pie chart there is um, pretty much equally distributed between fellows, that surgeons complaining about other surgeons, the public complaining about surgeons, and the trainees complaining about surgeons. Um, so that part of it seems OK. I'd have to say there's a, there's a great reticence of um, trainees to complain about their bosses. So of the 85, uh, at least of the 125 last year, uh, um, 56 were kind of uh, closed. They were just inquiries. Um, uh, there was a small amount of feedback sought, and the complainant was satisfied with the feedback that was uh, received. 67% um, of the complaints were related to unacceptable behaviours. Now, the end point of this is that uh, uh, people were offered uh, professional services in their workplace so by a college, like paid for by the college. So um, uh, that is just a graph to show that uh, the, the complaints received increased during the year and that most of them were resolved pretty well uh, uh, soon after they were received. Um, but the Converts International, which uh, I don't know if they're represented here today, but they're like a professional counselling service uh, is offered to people who complained uh, whether they need counselling. It's considered to be part of the bailiwick of the College of Surgeons. And I have to say it comes out of our budget that all of these courses that we're running, the, the campaigns, the complaints hot, hotline, the executive offices and the counselling services all comes out of um, surgeons' fees, uh, subscription fees. So where are we at now? Um, so the next part of uh, the culture change is trying to get gender equity and inclusion of diverse groups. And um, look, this is very hard. We set KPIs. There are some metrics around it. But you know how the, the actual enforcement, the, the enablement of this is very hard to achieve. Um, so to have equal numbers of male and female membership of college boards by 2020, that's going to be hard to do. The implementation of um, action plans for both uh, Aboriginal and uh, Maori. Um, so we've got some housekeeping stuff. Um, we provide breastfeeding rooms around our facilities around the, both countries and collection of data on uh, ethnic uh, diversity and uh, the culture of the boards. I will just point out this little example here. That, so we got invited to join these other companies, uh, some engineering and some university, just to look at our uh, female membership of boards. And um, this is a heat map here. The red is bad. We're, we're on the bottom there. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing to be on the bottom. but. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, I would just make the point, it, it's not just the surgeons who have a diversity problem. Like we, uh, we, we only have a third of our applicants are trainees, only 25% uh, accepted into training. Uh, new fellows, only about a fifth. And uh, on our boards, we have about one in 10. But we seem to be, you know, to some, to some degree in the same boat as all those other people there. So education, as I said, we, we're running more courses this year. This is really just... Uh, setting the ship and trying to get through the numbers and trying to prove that there is some good outcome to that. Um, and uh, the multi-source feedback tool I talked about. So complaints management, I, I think once, this is just a, an ongoing thing really. We, we do think the complaints might skyrocket once people understand that it can be truly 
confidential. There is, there is, as I said, there's a huge reticence out there for trainees to complain about their bosses, and we're not quite sure that that's become obvious in the past 12 months, and we're not quite sure how um, we can get around that problem. Um, if you want to complain about me, that's the number to phone. Um, so what have we learned? So we think it's not just surgeons. I mean, we accept that we're part of this, and uh, and we might be the beginning. And uh, we don't think we're the end of it. We're certainly part of it. And uh, but we can't change it all by ourselves. Um, so we, we need to engage you all, uh, and we need to all be on the same team there. So things coming down from the college president don't work so well because uh, we're not employees of the college. The college has its governance by ensuring continuing professional development, not by, um, not because we employ the people. We, have, we don't have that power over them. And private hospitals would have like uh, privileges, I guess. That, that would be how would you exert governance over groups. But it has to be local people who are champions of change. You need to find a, a local person in your hospital who will be a champion. Um, so but we, we think the justification is obvious. The best one is that, uh, that bullies have worse clinical outcomes. That, that can be demonstrated again and again in the literature. If they're bad with their attitude, they're going to have bad results. And you shouldn't think twice about uh, singling those people out for more attention because that, they'll eventually be bad for your hospital. So the message has to be simple, and we have to get broad agreement. These are all parenthood statements, really. It's a pretty complex process. We're, we're not really on top of it. As I said, this, is a, this story today is that we have got a problem and we're trying to address it. Um, and we don't really want to duplicate what is already existing in industrial law. And we have to have consistency in our group across two countries, Australia and New Zealand. So we think it's a three to five year project. Uh, we think that uh, perhaps our five year report card will be better than our one year report card. So what can you do? You just, I think the biggest thing is to um, have a local champion, that you have surgeons in your hospitals, someone who's in tune with this message and things you can do, you can, you can host one of the courses I was talking about, an anti-bullying course, a foundation uh, skills course. You can put up posters. There are posters of 2,000 surgeons out there with a little anti-bullying message around them. Um, I know the ones of Mata Tamata had to be taken down after about a week for being defaced, but uh, that's, that's something about Australian culture, I think. Um, uh, so in, engage, you're, you're a hospital administrator, so that's why I'm engaging with you right now. Okay. And you just have to share what's accepted. Uh, I think the other thing is about being brave. So, look, cultural change is incredibly difficult. I, education, I think we're okay with. Cultural change is very difficult. We, we lead by example. And surgeons really work as teams. I mean, um, as Wendell Saylor said, there's no I in team, but there's five in individual brilliance. Um, and surgeons do live that life. But um, we, we, we do best when we're in teams. And, and it's just a, a, a fact in the workplace here. So uh, thanks to all the people in the college and all the fellows who help us put this together. And I'd be okay for some questions. All right, we have that awkward moment where we ask for questions and nobody wants to be the first, but we do have somebody who's already put their hand up. Thank you very much. So given that our hospitals do two thirds of the elective surgery around the country on the private side, what, what is the college doing to engage with our hospitals in terms of feedback around surgeons who don't follow our codes of conduct beyond where it escalates to an ARPA issue or a more significant issue? So... Uh, your, your stats are probably a significant um, underestimate of the problem given that a lot of the surgery takes place in private hospitals and I'm not sure you're getting all that feedback. Yeah, so the source of the data is just the source of the data. Um, so two thirds. So m most surgeons work in private. It's just a fact of nature. I, I can only assume no one's complained about your surgeons. The, to the college. Yeah. So yeah. so what? If you're looking at getting a global view of the problem beyond trainees reporting in the public system, private system does a lot of the elective surgery. Is there a mechanism that the college is using beyond talking for 30 minutes at, R at APHA with the private sector? So I think we've talked to 42 different groups so far around both countries, but if you give us your card, we'll come and visit you and we'll talk to you about uh, MOU. I mean, have you complained about a surgeon yourself? Mm. 
No, it, it's, a, it's a general comment. So having been involved in private hospital administration for the last 15 years and having um, regular issues with surgeon behaviour and we develop codes of conduct, we work um, you know, with surgeons when things go wrong. My comment, I suppose, rather than a question is, is this an underestimate of the problem, given that you're probably more reliant on the public side and maybe trainees reporting their supervisor? Yeah, so look, I, I think there is a wonderful opportunity to engage with private hospitals. I, I appreciate these numbers are very small. I, I, I think, um, look, I, I do think most surgeons work in private. I think that in our college there are 6,000 fellows and only 20% are full-time employees of hospitals. Most of them work in private. It's a great opportunity to change behaviour. I'm a bit limited with governance, like I said. We don't employ the surgeons either. I mean, it's an awkward point. Everyone depends on surgeons to get throughput through their hospitals. Often the big bullies are the people that have the big throughput. Like, how do you how do you limit that without um, how do you how do you you don't want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg, I guess. I've got a I've got a question. Um, just wondering, hi. Just wondering what engagement you have with other colleges, because if your college is leading the way um, with cultural change. How do you engage and, and influence the other colleges so that they can um, parallel what you're trying to achieve? Otherwise, you'll be a group in isolation and you won't be affecting the broader um, other craft groups that, that can exhibit similar behaviours. So the anaesthetist and the College of ONG have both taken our program holdus bolus. Um, there's a meeting of um, heads of medical colleges that occurs quite frequently. Uh, our college meetings, at least our council meetings, have the head of the College of the Anaesthetists attend for a full day. Their, their, their program is all called almost identical to what ours is called. And that's Australia-wide? And New Zealand. New Zealand. OK, thanks. Do we have any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Just uh, down here in the front. Thank you. Uh, just a quick comment and then a question. Um, just in terms of the representation of women on your boards and other bodies, and you're comparing yourself with the other organisations, um, many of those other organisations would have a far lower percentage of women coming um, and graduating through the ranks. So I wouldn't be too um, comforted by that if I was you. And I think it's really, really important that you insist on a much higher representation of women um, in the various governance bodies that you have. That's my comment. My question, I'm just interested in whether you see much difference between what happens in New Zealand and what happens in Australia, and have you had to modify your programs on that basis? Well, the big difference is the private hospital engagement. There's much less private hospital interaction there. So, so there's a definite employer uh, kind of hierarchy there. It's easier to enforce for what it's worth. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Please thank Chris, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.